So recently, Joe Rogan and Wes Huff had a viral video where they claimed the Big Bang requires a miracle. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. But as one of the authors of a new book on the Big Bang, The Battle of the Big Bang, I thought it'd be helpful to point out precisely where they've gone wrong. However many billions of years ago, there was nothing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there was something. And Terence McKenna had a great line that said that um, science requires one miracle. Hmm. The Big yeah. Bang. It yeah, requires, totally. It requires a miracle. Well, I always say that when people ask me about, you know, the miracles in the Bible. Yeah. And I say, well, you know, if the first miracle happened, if everything, you know, nothing became everything, right. then, you know, Jesus turning water into wine. That's an easy one. Well, yeah. That's a it's, party it's, trick. It's, yeah, exactly. It really is nothing compared to the birth of the universe, but we're, we're convinced at the creation of the universe, and we're very skeptical at other miracles. So this is just not correct. The Big Bang Theory doesn't say that the universe came from nothing. What the Big Bang Theory says is that the universe evolved from a very hot, dense state. And if you don't believe me on that, you can check out the survey uh, that we did on leading physicists at a conference in Copenhagen, where we asked them what they think the Big Bang means, and they agreed that it meant the universe evolved from a hot, dense state. Nothing to do with it coming from nothing. That's just a misconception. Um, now, it's true that we don't know what happened before this hot, dense state, but that does not invalidate the Big Bang because the Big Bang just says it came from this hot, dense state. Now, a little bit of a plug, you know, I've got this book that I've written with Niyaya Shafshori, and we go over some of the competing ideas for what happened before the Big Bang, what put the bang into the bang, as it were. And it's true that there are some that have a sort of creation ex nihilo um, notion in them, but they don't really appear to violate any laws of physics. So I think it's not a good candidate for a miracle. Um, but more importantly, the reason that we take the Big Bang Theory so seriously, as opposed to miracle claims in the Bible and other ancient texts, is that the Big Bang Theory makes very exquisite predictions for data that astronomers then go and collect. And what we see is a very precise agreement between the data and the predictions. So here's a quick example. This is looking at the temperature properties of the cosmic microwave background. It was collected by a satellite that NASA launched called COBE in the 1990s. And what you see, these red crosses are falling perfectly on the line that the theory predicts. Now, challenge to Joe Rogan and Wes Huff, if you think there's a comparison then between uh, turning water into wine and the Big Bang, show me predictions from that theory of water being turned into wine or that historical account that can match this sort of accuracy that we get from the science of cosmology. There's really nothing like that. You do see when the Big Bang is first hypothesized that there are individuals who are f uncomfortable with that sounding like in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because before that, the idea was that the universe was eternal. Yeah. And, and if you propose a point in time where everything starts to exist, well, that for, and you see some of these people are pushing back on it. They, they, they say things like, well, that sounds too religious. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a beginning point in time. Right. And at that point, if there's a big bang, you have to figure out, okay, well, what's the big banger? Right. And I mean, that's ultimately, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a metaphysical religious question. How did that thing get kicked off? So Wes Huff doesn't give a reference here, but he's probably thinking of Fred Hoyle, who was a cosmologist, who was an atheist, and was motivated to oppose the Big Bang because of his atheism. And this is often used as part of a narrative to suggest that the wider atheist community rejected the Big Bang for reasons similar to Hoyle. But the thing is, Hoyle was one guy. I could give you an example of theists who opposed the Big Bang, like um, Eddington and Lovell, well-known astronomers, who, yes, opposed the Big Bang. And I could give you an example of atheists who were major proponents of the Big Bang. Um, Gamov, Dickey, Penrose, Hawking, and these were key developers of the Big Bang Theory as we know it today. So um, this narrative, I think, is not really well founded in the historical evidence. Now, it is true to say that a lot of physicists did reject the Big Bang, but was it because of their atheism? Well, there was a couple of other reasons that aren't often discussed. 
One, I think, particularly important is that in the 1940s and 50s, when there was this rivalry between the steady state and the Big Bang, um, the Big Bang theory seemed to predict that the universe was younger than the Earth, something obviously impossible. So that was a really good reason to reject the Big Bang. Um, another reason that many physicists rejected the Big Bang, and they also rejected the steady state as well, uh, was because they didn't take cosmology very seriously. They didn't think it was uh, a proper science. Um, one physicist, I think it was Rutherford, said something like, don't let me catch anyone talking about the universe in my department. Um, so they just didn't take cosmology seriously. Um, so the widespread dismissal or maybe refusal to accept the Big Bang in the 40s and 50s, I don't think was because of atheism. Another thing that Weishaupt doesn't mention is that the idea that the universe was eternal into the past, I think was enshrined into Western thought by theists. A great example would be Aristotle. He thought the universe was eternal into the past. He was a theist and he was extremely influential in the history of Western philosophy. As we move into uh, the more scientific age, Newton thought the universe was eternal into the past. And again, he was a theist. Now, this idea that people were scared of the link between the Big Bang and the book of Genesis, because Genesis talks about uh, the beginning of time, and the creation of the universe, I think this is extremely dubious. If you look at the Hebrew, you don't see anything about a beginning of time. Uh, you do have this phrase, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but, but the phrase heavens is Hashemayim, and that could just as easily be translated as the sky. And the phrase, the earth, um, is Haaretz, and that could just as easily be tra translated as the land. So maybe it should be, in the beginning, God created the sky and the land. That doesn't really sound like the wider universe that we think of when we think of cosmology. There were um, Jewish philosophers, um, even at the time of Jesus, uh, who thought that the creation was not ex nihilo, but rather God created out of existing materials. And again, looking at the biblical text, we see that God moves over the face of the waters before he does any creating. So it's not at all clear that uh, the Bible is talking about the beginning of time at all. And in fact, many biblical scholars think Genesis 1 should read when God began to create rather than in the beginning. A position my friend John Nelson, a biblical scholar who's critiqued Wes Huff, told me was actually consensus. Now, I sympathise with Wes's demand that we want to know, you know, what the banger was, what put the bang into the Big Bang, but there's no reason at all to think that this has to be a metaphysical or religious question. Um, in our book, Battle of the Big Bang, we have many different scientific ideas that could explain that. So we talk about eternal inflation, um, about cyclic models, about bouncing models, uh, holographic cosmology, um, closed timeline curves, there's all kinds of ideas out there. And I think if Wes wants to say that this has to be a metaphysical or religious question, that uh, science couldn't answer this, then he's going to have to show what's wrong with these models. And he hasn't done that. Now, of course, you can posit God as the creator of the universe if you wish, um, but there's nothing in the science that suggests that we have to do so. Brian Cox was explaining to us that there was an actual environment that existed pre the Big Bang. Don't they call it the environment? Is that what the, the term of it is? Is this like Lawrence Krauss having a definition for nothing? I don't it's know. It's not nothing? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it was just like, what are you even saying? You know, and then there's Sir Roger Penrose who thinks there's a series of right. these things that yeah. happen. And that yeah. it's just this constant birth of universes and death of universes and birth of new universes. And it's like Big Bang, expansion, heat death. Yeah. Contraction, Big Bang. Like, but we're almost like, that's too much. I don't want to. I can kind of wrap my head around 14 billion years. I can't wrap my head around eternity. So the environment Joe Rogan mentions that Brian Cox told him about is almost certainly the infliton field. This is a field that is hypothesized to drive an exponential period of expansion. And that is thought in many models to precede the Big Bang. In some textbooks, you'll see it happened after the Big Bang, but I think that's not correct. Um, there are good reasons to think it happened before the Big Bang, but notice the implication here, 
That means that the Big Bang didn't come from nothing. It came from this inflating space. Now, of course, it's possible to hypothesize what came before the inflating space. There's some controversy as to whether inflation happened. But if it did, of course, we still want to know what came before. And honest answer is we don't know. Um, but there's nothing in the theory then that says it went from nothing to something. That's, that's not in the theory. You can hypothesize that if you wish. Uh, but that's a completely separate process. And if Brian Cox is telling you there was something before the Big Bang, something kind of, some kind of environment, i.e. the Middleton field, then clearly what Brian Cox is telling you is that the idea that you have, the Big Bang says the universe went from nothing to something, is not correct. Now, then Wes Huff talks about uh, Lawrence Krauss talking about nothing when it's not really nothing. Now, here I think there's a lot of confusion. Because what people accuse Krauss of saying is that, well, hey, the universe came from a quantum vacuum fluctuation, and that's from nothing. And uh, of course, uh, vacuum is not nothing. We know from quantum mechanics that's the case. Vacuum is not nothing. Absolutely right. But there are other ideas proposed by, let's say, Alex Vilenkin, where the universe is not coming from a vacuum fluctuation. Rather, the idea is that space itself fluctuates into existence. And that's a pretty wild idea, no question about it, but it is not coming from a vacuum. So this equivocation that Wes Huff is sort of accusing Krauss of making, uh, that looks like a confusion on, Huff's, on Wes Huff's part. Um, and I think he doesn't understand this distinction between the universe coming from a vacuum fluctuation and space itself fluctuating fluctuating into existence. Um, now then Joe Rogan starts talking about Penrose's model and he says it expands and contracts. That's not what happens in Penrose cyclic model. It does not contract. It goes through what's called a conformal transformation. Um, again, reading our book, Battle of the Big Bang, we explain what that is, but it is not a contraction. Now I sympathize with Joe Rogan's idea that we just can't get our head around infinity because Penrose is suggesting um, that there are real actual infinities, that the universe exists for an infinite amount of time, uh, that it's cyclic and goes, you can go back and forwards forever in time. And it's, it's true that we can't in some ways get our head around infinity. But I think there's a super simple explanation for this because everything in our everyday lives is finite. Of course, that doesn't mean that the universe is finite. What it does mean, though, is that the infinite is going to seem counterintuitive to us. But hey, quantum mechanics seems counterintuitive to us. Surely Joe doesn't want to say that quantum mechanics is wrong. I mean, I don't know, maybe he does. Uh, but these things are backed by overwhelming evidence of quantum mechanics in, in this case. Um, and infinity is at least very well defined mathematically. So it makes perfect logical sense that the universe is infinite. It may or may not be, we don't know, but I think there's no reason to dismiss it as Joe does because he can't get his head around it. I mean, in some sense, none of us can get our head around it in the sense of grasping it maybe intuitively. Um, but this is where mathematics comes in. We can write this stuff down mathematically and it's very well defined and free from contradiction. I mean, and you can say that there's theories. It's not, it's not completely unexplained. They kind of get it, but you kind of don't. Something that's smaller than the head of a pin that becomes the entire universe that we say is pretty fucking crazy. Yeah. You know, and just to say that that just happened and you don't, you don't really, I know you don't want to say you don't know, but you really don't know. There's no way you can know. It's yeah. not really possible to know. There's no like working theory where you can convince me that, the whole universe gets compressed into something smaller than the head of a pen and then instantaneously becomes everything that you see. Well, I think that's why you see natural materialism being woefully inadequate to really explain the ultimate worldview questions that we have. Scientists are open to saying that we don't know what came before the hot, dense Big Bang day. I've interviewed many of the world's leading cosmologists, including Stephen Hawking, Roger Penrose, Alan Guth, and that is the impression that I get. They don't claim sort of certainty in their ideas about the very early universe. But when Joe says there's no way we can know, or it's not possible to know, I don't know what justifies that. Maybe he could explain that because we have ideas that we mentioned in our book um, where we could probe um, very early universe cosmology, not through looking at light, 
but through primordial gravitational waves. These would be an incredible probe. So I don't think Joe's really correct here. He also says that the transition into the sort of universe that we see was instantaneous. That's not correct. It, uh, there's nothing in Big Bang physics that says that's what happened. Um, now, he says there's no way you could convince him, but whilst I'm trying to convince Joe, the job of science is not to try and convince Joe. The job of science is to make theories that make predictions um, that are then tested against the data. And certainly the idea that the universe evolved from this extremely hot dense state has been tested against the data. So there's really no question that that is what happened. Um, I think Joe is sort of giving a sort of really simple logical fallacy here, which is called the argument from personal incredulity. It basically says, well, I can't believe that, so therefore it didn't happen. Again, sympathies, because this stuff is certainly counterintuitive. So if you're relying on the intuitions that you have from the world around you, sure, the Big Bang is going to seem very, very strange. But one thing physics has taught us is that the world at a fundamental level is very strange. It doesn't conform to our intuitions. But so what? <laughs> Why should it? Um, our intuitions were evolved to function on the savanna. There's no reason to think that our intuitions should be tuned to understanding quantum processes or, or relativistic processes. Um, and then Wes Huff says that this means natural materialism is inadequate. I don't see why. Uh, I think we have very good working models of the early universe and there's no reason to think that supernaturalism can do any better. Just the universe itself, right? Just yeah. what we don't know enough. Maybe we one day will. So I do like Joe Rogan's sort of optimistic tone at the end that, you know, one day maybe we will understand this stuff. But again, we have to make this distinction between understanding the notion of the universe evolving from a hot dead state, which we already do, and that is not up for debate, and understanding what came before that hot dead state. And that is open to question, and we certainly don't know. But as we discuss in the book, there are probes on the drawing board that could actually do this. So there's every reason for optimism, and there's no reason at all to think that the Big Bang is a miracle, requires a miracle, or isn't well evidenced by data. That's something that cannot be said for the resurrection or turning water into wine. These comparisons are totally inappropriate. Okay, well, I hope you found that interesting, maybe even enlightening. If you like this video, please give it a like on YouTube. Leave your comments in the comment section. We'll be fascinated to hear them. And I'll give a last shameless plug for the book. If you are interested in the Big Bang and what might have triggered it, then Battle of the Big Bang is the book for you.